ladies and welcome to another edition of our weekly Torah classes and whether you're logging on to ohelsara.com or to Torah anytime or if you're a YouTube subscriber and you follow us every single week I thank you so much for tuning in and for devoting yourself to Torah to the learning of Hashem's words His holy words uh, welcome thank you so much for coming first and foremost I want to thank Erica Olson and Judith Nesmeli Lobeer. I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly for your recent donation to Ohel Sarah. Thank you so very, very much. I really appreciate it. This week's Shi'ul is going to be dedicated in memory of Thomas Zakowski, Alava Shalom, who passed away just three weeks ago. This shiul was donated, sponsored by his sister-in-law, Marvita Workis. Uh, I believe she's in Missouri, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I want to thank Marvita so very much. She called us. Uh, she was all emotional, and she asked to donate this money, uh, partly for the shiul and also to help the, that needy family, if you remember from Pesach with the 11 children that we were collecting for, she also donated towards them. Thank you so very much, Marvita. Kadosh Baruch Hu Hashem should bless you, keep you safe from harm, protected, should give you nachat ruach, should always see uh, uh, happiness, and Kadosh Baruch Hu should pour down upon you calmness and peacefulness in your life. You should only see good things uh, and again, this shiul is being dedicated Le'ilui Nishma Thomas Zakowski, who passed away, Alava uh, Shalom, three weeks ago. Whatever inspiration everybody reaps uh, should be Le'ilui Nishmato. We have a lot of work to do today. As you know, Shavuot is coming up in just a few days from now. It's the holiday of the giving of the Torah. It's the holiday that we celebrate also the Yorzeit, the anniversary of the passing of David HaMelech Alava Shalom, and by extension, his entire lineage which traces back to Ruth HaMoaviyah, the great and famous convert from Moav. So tonight's shiur is going to also be dedicated to David HaMelech Alava Shalom, to Ruth HaMoaviyah, Alea Shalom, to Boaz, the man who agreed to marry her, Alea Shalom, to Naami, that agreed to accept her, to all the major players in the story. So tonight's Shi'u begins in a very unassuming place, a place we wouldn't think to begin when discussing Shavuot, and that's Parashat Vayera from Sefer Bereshit. We all know the story of the three angels who come to visit Avraham Avinu Alav Shalom following his Brit Milah. Avraham is sitting at the opening of his tent and suddenly three men are standing over him. Rashi HaKadosh Alav Shalom comments that they were not regular men. They were Malachim. And three of them came because one was going to offer the good news to Sarah Imenu Alea Shalom that she was going to have a baby decades after being barren. Ve'echad, Rashi says, la'fochet zdom. One was there to, to destroy Zedom. Ve'echad le'rapot et Avraham. And one angel came just to heal Avraham from the brit milah, from the circumcision. So Rashi wonders, why do you need three separate angels? Why can't just one angel come down to do all three actions? And Rashi HaKadosh answers, She'en malach echad oseh shtei shlichuyot. One angel cannot do more than one task. Every angel has its function, its purpose, and he can only do one action at a time. So who were these angels who came to Avraham? Rashi in the Gemara of Baba Metziah says that they were 
מלאך גבריאל, מלאך רפאל, and מלאך מיכאל. מיכאל came to offer the good news that Sarah was going to have a baby. רפאל came to heal Abraham. And Gabriel, the angel of fire, was sent to destroy the city of Zdom. But then the Gemara asks a question. When we get to the story of the destruction of Zdom, it seems that two Malachim went together. Wasn't Gabriel in charge of the destruction of Zdom? Why does the Pasuk tell us, Vayavau shnei hamalachim? It seems that Gabriel went to destroy Zdom, but Michael tagged along, he went with him. Why did Michael go to Zdom together with Gabriel? What's that all about? So in order to answer these questions, we're going to first analyze the story in detail and we're going to connect it to Shavuot. Because as you noticed, I'm in the wrong era here. Right? I mean, what does this story of Abraham and the angels coming to visit him have anything to do with Ruth, with David, with Shavuot? <coughs> we'll soon see. Anyhow, after Abraham greets the Malachim, the Pasuk tells us that the first question Gabriel asks him is, Aye Sarah Ishtecha. Where is Sarah, your wife? What an odd question for an angel to ask. Well, didn't he know where she was? I mean, angels know everything. What kind of question is that? Nevertheless, Abraham is not jarred by this and he responds saying, Hine ba'ohel. Behold, she is in the tent. Rashi HaKadosh, Allah Shalom, comments on Abraham's response and writes, Tsenu'ahi. In his response to the Malachim, Abraham wasn't just telling the angels where Sarah was, but he was actually defining a quality that she possessed. She was in the tent, not because she didn't feel well, not because that's where the Wi Fi service uh, is. She was in the tent because she was Tsenu'ah, she was a modest woman. Being in the tent was a manifestation of her modesty. She was not the kind of woman who uh, publicizes herself. And the holy Kliyakar, Allah Shalom, adds that the angels, the Malachim, wanted to point that out to Abraham. They wanted to point out Sarah's modesty. They wanted to highlight her tzini'ot. That's why they asked, Aye Sarah ishtecha. Where is Sarah, your wife? Because that prompted Abraham to say that she was in the tent, which in turn made them say, Oh, wow, tzini'ah, wow, she's a modest woman. So the Malachim were highlighting her tzini'ot, and as a result of that tzniut, says the Kliyakar, that Sarah wasn't only going to be informed that she's going to have a son that will be the progeny of Am Yisrael, but also that her descendants are going to be extraordinarily special, and that one day in the future, they'll become kings of the nation of Am Yisrael. How do we see this? The Kliyakar writes, Amru Rabotenu Zichonam Livracha. Our blessed rabbis of past have said, Kol Kala Shahit Senu'ah. Any bride who behaves in a modest fashion, Zocha Veyetsu Mimena Melachim. She merits to have children who will one day be kings. The Chachamim in the Gemara of Megillah prove this by telling us the story of Tamar, Yehuda ben Yaakov, Allah Shalom's daughter-in-law. She too was very modest. She always covered her face to the extent that Yehuda, her own father-in-law, never saw what she looked like, if you could imagine that. That's how modest she was. Could you imagine? So Gemara says concerning Tamar, Vehi and she, Tamar, Gamhit Sanua, she was also very modest. Alken, therefore, Zechuta Garam Leyehud, 
her merit caused a future destiny. Just as it states in Sefer Bereshit, what destiny? Umelachim mimcha yetzeu. And kings will emerge from you. Well, who did Tamar give birth to? Tamar gave birth to two sons, Peretz and Zerach. The dynasty of Peretz eventually brings forth the birth of Yishai, who was the father of David Melech Israel, King David. So the Kli Akar is telling us that wherever you see exemplary tzniot, praiseworthy modesty, stay tuned, because Melachim will be born from that modesty. Kings are going to descend from a woman who has great tzniot. And the Kli Akar says that just like Tamar was tzenua, and merited to give birth to the dynasty of the royal line of Israel, so too over here with Sarah. The Malachim weren't just informing Abraham and Sarah that the, she's going to have a son, but that due to her modesty, the roots of David Amelech are going to be sown, and those roots begin because of Sarah. The modest woman who in the merit of her modesty will be zaycha to have kings, great kings that descend from her. So the Malachim were telling Abraham that the royal dynasty of Israel, the makings of David HaMelech and the Melech HaMashiach, obviously by extension, emanate from the tent of Sarah in her tzniot. Now, I just want to make an, uh, an observation concerning the story of Tamar. In Parashat Vayeshev, which is where her story is, we find Tamar sitting by the roadside, and the Pasuk states, Vateshev bepetach enayim. And she sat at the crossroads. Simply speaking, she sat at a fork in the road, and she did that because she knew that Yehuda frequently walks by that location and she saw through Ruach HaKodesh, through divine inspiration, that she's meant to bear great children with Yehuda, her father-in-law. But she needed to find, and she was of course, we know, a widow at that time, but she needed to find a way to persuade him to be with her. So she sat on this uh, road called Petach Enaim. When Yehuda arrived at that spot, he sees Tamar. And not knowing who she was, he didn't know she was his daughter-in-law. At the end, he ends up being with her. And who's conceived from that union? Peretz, who from him descends David HaMelech and the future Mashiach. So that union between Tamar and Yehuda created a tremendous result that started where? at the crossroads of Petachenaim. Does anybody know where that location is? I mean, if you'd look at a map, where's Petachenaim situated? Rashi HaKadosh Alav Shalom gives us the location. He says, Petachenaim, that specific place called Petachenaim, he says, Verabotenu darshu, our sages in the Gemara of Sota explained it midrashically to mean what? Bepitcho shel Avraham Avinu. That was the entrance to the residence of our forefather Avraham. Oh, well, that's significant. As it continues, why is it called Petach Enaim? He says, Shekol Enaim mitzapot, mitzapot liroto. All eyes were looking forward to seeing Avraham. They called the pathway, the entrance to Avraham's tent, Petach Enaim, because everybody came to see Avraham. The eyes of the world came to see this great and holy man, the one and only Avraham Avinu who believed in Hashem. He was the only monotheistic Jew. Now I ask, you think this is a coincidence? But obviously not. Not only that, but when the Malachim were speaking with Avraham, what does the Pasuk tell us about Sarah? Listen to the words. Vesara shomat petach ha'ohel. Oh, 
Sarah heard about the good news that she's going to have a baby as she's standing at the petach, at the entrance of the tent. That means, by the way, if she's, she's standing at the entrance, she's inside the tent. She was modest, right? That's what we said. And our Chachamim tell us that in the merit of that sniut, great kings were going to descend from her, including the Melech HaMashiach. Therefore, Tamar, who's the next part of this process of the bringing of the Mashiach, concerning her, the Gemara is telling us that in order for Tamar to be part of that process, she too stands by the Petach, by the entrance of Avraham, Petach and Aim, as if to hint to us that this, this is the root of salvation. It was the Tzni'ut of Sarah, followed by the Tzni'ut of Tamar, that activated the coming of Mashiach into the world, and Mashiach descends from the Davidic dynasty. She knew that, she knew that, that was the... She understood. This is, this is, this is the root. Right. This is the root. Not only, not only that, but when you, Yehuda arrived at Petach Enaim and saw Tamar, we said he didn't know who she was. The Pasuk says, Vayachshiveha, I'm sorry to say the word, Lezona. Initially, uh, he thought that she was a harlot because women didn't just stand at the crossroads of any, any, any uh, public place. So he said to himself, what am I doing here over here? Am I going to allow myself to be with this woman? And the Midrash tells us he started to turn away. The Midrash of Bereshit Rabbah states, when he turned away, Tamar was very disheartened because she knew that if Yehuda unites with her, something great will come from that union. So she started to pray, she started to daven, and then the Pasuk suddenly tells us, oh, Vayet Eleha, he turned towards her. Well, what changed his mind? He clearly didn't want to involve himself with a woman that he thought was a, a lady of the night. He turned away from her initially, but then he makes a U-turn and he heads in her direction. What happened? Says the Dad Zekenim and the Ba'alei HaTosafot, Alei Mashalom. Ela Bikeshlo, when he wanted to leave, Nasa enea la marom ve'amra. Tamar lifted her eyes to the heavens and she said, Ribon ha'olamim, master of the universe, v'chilo ani zocha le'otzi chacha migufo shel tzadik ze. God, am I not going to merit to create a tremendous soul, a wise soul from this huge tzadik Yehuda? He's leaving, he's turning away. Please bring him back to me. That's the minash, the Baalei HaTosafot. Miyad shalach lo HaKadosh Baruch Hu Michael. Immediately God sent the angel Michael in order to direct Yehuda back to Tamar. Oh, interesting, interesting. The malach used to facilitate this union was Michael. Michael seems to be tasked with very interesting missions. He's the one who gave the good news to Abraham that Sarah was going to have a baby. Michael is the one who ends up saving Lot from Sidon. He's the one involved in the union of Yehuda and Tamar. So there must be a connection between all his various missions. What might that connection be? Ladies, this is the part of the shiul where I tell you out there and everybody here, buckle your seatbelts, we're going for a big ride, drop everything you're doing, if you're cooking, stop, if you're sleeping, get up, if you're at work, take a break. If you're at home, put your feet up on the couch. You're going to need to hear this. Concentrate, because we're about to take an amazing ride, a journey through history with ideas. I don't want to say I'm going to knock your socks off, but I'm going to knock your socks off. 
The Gemara of Yevamot tells us an amazing story about Shaul HaMelech, Alav HaShalom, King Saul, who at a certain point was very impressed by a young lad named David. David wasn't yet king. He was a shepherd. And David had just come back from his victorious battle against Goliath, where he took his slingshot and with one stone killed the infamous giant. Shaul was so astounded that he walks into the Bet Midrash, to the study hall, and he inquires about David. And he asks, who is this one? Well, what do you mean, who is this one? Everybody knows who David was. He was David ben Yishai. But the Gemara says that Shaul was not asking who he was, but rather, which tribe does he descend from? Now, although everybody knew that David sends from Shevet Yehuda, from the tribe of Yehuda, Shaul wanted to know which of Yehuda's sons is David a descendant of. Because Yehuda had two sons, we said, Peretz and Zerach. And the Mesorah, the tradition held that the descendants of Zerach will be the princes of the nation, which means the leaders, the big rabbis, etc. They will be the Nesi'im, while the descendants of Peretz will produce kings, Melachim. Everybody knew that Malchut Yehuda, the kingship of Yehuda, follows the Peretz line. The Mashiach is going to descend from Peretz. So Shaul was asking, who does David descend from? Who is this one? Is he from the Zerach line or is he from the Peretz line? And he was told, oh, he, this one, he's from the line of Peretz. And that made perfect sense because Shaul says, oh, yes, makes sense. I see he has the makings and the composure of a king. I see that this young man has great potential. So the Gemara says that as they're discussing David and if he's worthy to be king or not, which is an unbelievable discussion <laughs> just in itself since Shaul was Melech at the time, as they're speaking about David's lineage and his uh, qualifications, his attributes, who walks into the Bet Midrash, into the study hall? A fellow named Doeg HaAdomi. Doeg was a great Talmud Chacham. He was a huge Torah scholar who was so sharp and so clever that very few were able to debate him in areas of Torah. People blushed. They would turn Adumim from embarrassment when they were stumped by his questions and his Torah dissertations with his debates and his arguments. By the way, that's how he got his nickname, Ha'adomi, Doeg Ha'adomi, because everyone would blush and turn red in the face from his uh, great uh, mind. But although he was a great scholar, he was also a big troublemaker. And without getting into details, it's not for this class, he's one of a few people who forfeited his share in Olam Haba, his share in the world to come, due to many evil acts that he unfortunately committed along the way. But that's not for the Shio. Anyhow, he walks into the Bet Midash and he hears that there's an intense discussion taking place. So he asks, uh, what's going on over here? What's, what's all the fuss about? What's everybody talking about today? What's the, what's the pilpul? So they say, oh, well, we're talking about the lineage of this young man named David, the son of Ishai. We're discussing his qualifications and if he's worthy to be king. Doeg starts to laugh. <laughs> he starts to laugh. And he says, Ad sheata mash'il alav im hagun hu lemalchut im lav. Before you even question his qualifications and whether he is or is not worthy to ascend to the throne, she'al alav im ra'oi lavo why don't you first ask if he is or isn't even worthy to enter into the congregation of Israel? Oh, 
Doeg just dropped a bomb in the Beth Mindash. He says, F forget about being king. He might not even be legitimate enough to be accepted into the Kahal Hashem, into the assembly of God. We may even ha have to oust him from the community. Forget about being king. <coughs> Everybody's shocked. Oust him from the Kahal? Oust him from the congregation? Why, they ask him. Mahita ama. What's the reason for this? And he says, what do you mean? Because David is a direct descendant of Vot HaMu'aviyah. Oh, here we go. Here we go. On Shavuot, we read Megillah Torot. What does the end of the Megillah state? We're given the entire family tree, beginning with Peretz. Ve'ele toledot Peretz. And we're given a list of descendants from Peretz all the way down to Boaz. And who did Boaz marry? Ruth. Where did Ruth come from? Ruth is a Moaviyah. She's a Moabite. She's a descendant of Moab. And what does the Torah HaKadoshah tell us about the Moavim, about the Moabites? The Torah in Sefer Devarim clearly states, Lo yavo amoni umoavi bekal Hashem. An Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter the assembly of God. We are not permitted to accept converts from the Ammoni or Moavi nations. So the egg uh, comes along and he says, hold it right there. <laughs> you know, uh, before you even talk about uh, uh, David's ascension to the throne, let's talk about the fact that Boaz married Ruth. Ruth is a, is a Moaviah. So all the descendants from that union are illegitimate and banned. End of story. According to Doeg, beginning with Boaz's son Oved, in with the union of uh, of Ot, from Oved through David and on, all those children are considered disqualified from entering the Kal Hashem. They're all banned because they come from Ruth. And since Ruth, according to him, was not allowed to enter the assembly of God, all of her descendants aren't only unworthy of being kings, they're not even permitted to be part of the Jewish nation. Wow. The Gemara says this was such a huge controversy. In one second, David Amelech went from almost being king to being deemed unworthy of entering the Ka'al Hashem, the assembly of God. But as you know, when it concerns Torah discussions, there's always going to be a pilpul. There's always going to be some back and forth debate. So what happened? The Gemara says that suddenly a man named Avner Ben Ner, that's who you're talking about, the general of Shaul, Alav Shalom, who was a very learned scholar, he joined the debate. And he says, uh, turns to Doeg and he says, excuse me Doeg, but we have a Braita. We have an oral tradition that says, Amoni velo Amonit. Moavi velo Moavit. The ban against Amon and Moav only applies to the men, not the women. It's Moavi. It's a male who comes from Moav who is not permitted to enter the Ka'al Hashem. Not a Moavit, not a female. Nice try, Doeg, but Ruth is a Moavit, she's a female, and therefore there's no ban on the women, so she's legitimate, which means her descendants are kosher, and that means that David is worthy to be king. That was Avner's answer. Doeg didn't wave the white flag yet. He didn't surrender. He fought back. What did he say? 
turns to Avner and he says, uh, Avner, it's a very nice uh, drash he just brought down over here, you know, oh yeah, the Pasuk says, Lo yavo mo'avi bekal Hashem, and you're saying, oh, it means uh, mo'avi velo mo'avi, that it applies to the men and not the ladies. A very good drash, very good, I like it. But if you're right, then let me ask you this. The Torah in Sefer Devarim says, Lo yavo mamzer bikal Hashem. A child born of an illicit marriage shall not enter the assembly of God. We're not allowed to accept the mamzer into the kal Hashem. According to what you're saying, we could say, Oh, mamzer, velo mamzeret. Does this law only apply to the males born of an illicit marriage, not to the females? Obviously not. Clearly the Torah is referring to all mamzerim, both male and female alike, who are born from such a union. So where do you come off deciding that when it concerns the Mo'avim here, ah, the Torah was only banning the men and not the women? Everyone in the Bet Midrash blushed. Because no one had an answer they could provide to Do'ega Adomi. Be'emet. We can't say Mamzer velo Mamzeret. So how, do we, how are we going to get out of this one? So the Gemara says eventually they told the egg, the egg the following. They said, listen, there's a reason Hashem doesn't allow us to accept converts from Moab. What does this mean? When Am Yisrael came out of Egypt, en route to Eretz Yisrael, they passed by the nation of Moab. Now, the Chachamim tell us that the proper derech Eretz, the common courtesy, is that the nation of Moab, they should have come out and been hospitable to the Jewish people. They knew the Jews were tired. They knew we were hungry and thirsty from the traveling. They should have offered us something to eat, something to drink, but they didn't. And worse, even when we offered to pay them for a cup of water, they refused us. We're offering to pay you, and you're, and, and, and you're saying, no, I can't deal with this? Get out? So Hashem classified them as cruel people. Because they're cruel people, they were banned from entering the Ka'al Hashem, the Assembly of God. So the Gemara asks, well, in those days, obviously, who normally goes out to greet a nation? The men, I mean, that's what the Gemara, the Gemara says, It's the men, it's the derech, it's like the proper uh, 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 protocol that the men go out to greet. It's, it wasn't the way of the women to go out and to greet people, why? Because it's not considered tsanua. It's, it's regarded as an immodest act. So because it's not the way of a woman to go out and greet others, the Gemara seems to imply, the Mo'avi women did not go out to offer uh, food and drink to the nation of Israel. So all, all of these uh, Talmidei Chachamim and the Bet Midrash on that day, they were telling Doeg, we shouldn't blame them for following the proper laws of Tzani'ot. That's why the ban, by the way, was placed against the men of Moab and not the women. Doeg, that's the real reason. Now you gotta, you gotta admit, that's a good, uh, good argument. Doeg hears this argument and he says, I agree with you. I agree with you. It might not be the way of a woman to go out and to greet the men. But couldn't the Moavi women have gone out to greet the Jewish women? Couldn't they have served the Jewish women a cup of water? They should have at least been hospitable to the Jewish women. 
and because they weren't, they're just as guilty as the men. So just like the Moavi men are punished for their cruelty and lack of, lack of hospitality, the Moavi women should be punished as well. And that makes Ruth illegitimate and by extension anybody who came from her. So David is Pasul, he's banned and he cannot be king. Have a nice day. Now everybody's stumped. Nobody knows what to say, what to do, how to answer. He has a good point. The Gemara says that they all accepted Doeg's reasoning and they were about to hang posters all over the city announcing David's illegitimacy. David was very close to being banned from the Kal Hashem, from the Assembly of God. But what happened? Another huge Talmid Chacham, another huge Torah scholar named Amasa came to the Bet Midrash. He got wind of the entire discussion and what they were just about to do, hang posters everywhere. What did he do? He, Ma says he removed the sword from his sheath and he held it up for everyone to see. And he says, Kol Whoever doesn't hear the following law, Yedaker Bacherev is going to be stabbed with this sword. Kach mekubelani mi beddino shel Shmuel haramati. He says, there's a tradition that was brought down from the Judiciary Tribunal, from the Holy Prophet Shmuel Anavi. And that tradition goes back to Moshe Rabbeinu, alav shalom. Shmuel taught us the tradition. And anything that comes out of the mouth of this holy prophet is Kodesh Kodashim. Because Shmuel is one of the links in the chain that goes back to the traditions and the teachings that were taught at Har Sinai. As we know, he says, Moshe kibel Torah mi Sinai. Moshe received the Torah from Hashem on Mount Sinai. Um sara le Yehoshua. And he passed it down to his foremost student, Yehoshua. Ve Yehoshua len vi'im. And Yehoshua passed it down to the prophets. Part of that link that began at Har Sinai includes the Nevi'im, and includes the prophets. So Shmuel knows exactly what the laws were that were clarified at Har Sinai. And he said, Kach mekubelani, this, it was, this is what was passed down to me, says Shmuel, from my rabbi going back to Har Sinai. Amoni velo amonit. Mo'avi velo mo'avit. This law of the mo'avim and amonim applies only to the men and not to the women. That's the mesorah. That's our tradition. And we don't ask questions on something that's a mesorah. We follow the tradition that goes all the way back to Moshe Rabbeinu. Finished. So the Gemara concludes. The Bemet, really, we don't argue with our traditions, with the Mesorah. But there's a question that needs to be asked. Doeg did have a valid point about the Moavi women, says the Gemara. Why didn't the Moaviot go out to greet at least the Jewish women? One woman is allowed to greet another woman. Doeg has a good claim. The Moaviot should be held accountable for being inhospitable and for being cruel in the same way the men were. And the Gemara concludes that even though we have a Mesorah, although the tradition tells us that the women of Moab are not banned, listen to these words, Mikol Makom, even though, even as such, as much as we follow the tradition, this is one point here the Gemara says that remains a very difficult question. It's a very difficult question. Could it, could it also have been an issue of snoot? If the men and the women are out there 
A woman should really put herself in a situation where she's exposed to all the men also. Oh, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. So far, so good. So obviously the Gemara doesn't just leave it like that. Because that would present a huge problem for many who descend from Ruth. So the Gemara tries to offer an answer. And it actually quotes who? Sefer Teilim. David's words. Kol kevuda bat melech penima. The honor of the daughter of the king is found within. It's the way of a woman to be modest and to remain inside. Says the Gemara. We cannot have a claim as to why the Moavi women didn't go out to greet the Jewish women because women didn't go out in the streets altogether. They were barely seen in a public domain. The modesty of a woman is pnima, is to remain inside. And the Gemara asks, well, yeah, but where do we know that from? Where do we learn that from? Says the Gemara, we learn it from the Malachim who when they came to visit Avraham, they asked him, Ayei Sarah Ishtecha, where is your wife Sarah? And he replied, Hinei Ba'ohel, behold, she is in the tent. We learn the extent of a woman's modesty, says the Gemara, from Sarah. Wow. The Gemara itself is taking us back to Parashat Vayera <laughs> when Avraham answered Hinei Ba'ohel Behold she is in the tent which means that was a clear indication of her modesty, of her tzini'ut. So the Gemara concludes that we cannot have any claims against the Mo'avi women who did not go out to greet the Jewish women because it wasn't the custom of women to go out and greet even if it meant greeting another woman. And we learn that from Sarah Imenu. That's the Gemara. That's the Gemara. Now once we know this Gemara, we could appreciate another Pasuk in Sefer Teilim that David HaMelech wrote. Remember, we have to remember that David HaMelech was almost officially banned from the Ka'al Hashem, from the assembly of God. Baruch Hashem, he saved, he was saved. So he writes the following, David. Ana Hashem, ki ani avdecha. Remember that song? Ana Hashem, Ana Hashem, ki ani avdecha. He says, Please God, for I am your servant. Ani avdecha, I am your servant, ben amatecha, the son of your maidservant. Pitachta lemoserai, you have loosened my bonds. David says, Hashem, you opened my shackles. Pitachta lemoserai. And Chachamim say, by the way, Moserai doesn't just mean shackles. The word Moserai also comes from the word Asul, which means forbidden. So David says, Hashem, they wanted to place an Isu on me. They wanted to place a ban against me. They were going to say that I am Asul, that I'm forbidden to enter the Ka'al Hashem. Thank you, Hashem. Pitachta lemoserai. Thank you for opening my shackles that you saved me from this Isul of entering your holy assembly. And thank you to Shmuel Navi, to his traditions that saved me. As we know, on Shavuot we read Megillat Rut. The Gemara says that the author of Megillat Rut is Shmuel Hanavi, is the prophet Shmuel. For what reason did he write this Megillah, the scroll of Rut? What, what, what was the purpose? And the Gemara answers that he wrote it 
in order to establish the legitimacy of David HaMelech. The objective of Megillah Torut are actually the final psukim, which read, O Boaz holid et Oved, and Boaz bore Oved, ve Oved holid et Yishai, and Oved bore Yishai, ve Yishai holid et David, and Yishai bore David. That's why we read it. Shmuel wrote, Shmuel wrote the Megillah in order to make it very clear that David is legitimate and that we should not say, not even think, that he's not permitted to enter the Kaal Hashem. Shmuel says, I have a Mesorah, I have a tradition that dates back to Har Sinai and that tradition is going to be highlighted in this Megillah. This Megillah is the pedigree, it's the lineage of the Meyuchasim. I wrote it in order to establish David's kashrut, his validity. By the way, David appreciated this and he mentions it in Sefer Tehilim, where he states, Hinevati bimgilat sefer katuv alai. Behold, I have come with a scroll of a book written for me. David says, Hinebati, I'm here on this earth. I arrived towards my mission safely. I'm legitimate. Bati, I'm here. I have an existence in Am Israel. And what's the proof that I'm valid, that I'm legitimate? Bimgilat Sefer. Shmuel Hanavi wrote an entire scroll about me. Katuv Alai. He wrote it in order to show that I am indeed valid and worthy. Once we get to this point, we could learn the words of the holy Chidushe Arim, Allah Shalom, who is the great Kutzka Rebbe, who asks a question that takes us back to the story of Avraham Avinu. Michael came to tell Avraham that Sarah was going to have a baby. Now because he's the Tsar of Israel, Michael, because the progeny of Am Yisrael is about to be conceived, it makes sense that Michael should be the one who delivers the good news. The Katzka Rebbe asks, what was Gabriel doing over there? What was his reason for being there? After all, his job was to destroy Zdom. So he should have gone to destroy Zdom. What was he doing here with the other Malachim having on with Avraham? What's he doing there? What was the purpose of coming to Avraham on that day? He doesn't have to heal Avraham. That's Raphael's job. He doesn't have to give the good news that Sarah is having a baby. That was Michael's job. So what was he doing there? Why does Gabriel take a detour to visit Avraham before going to destroy his dome? That's the Kotzka Rebbe's question. And it's an amazing question. Furthermore, he points out, wasn't it a bit strange for Gabriel to ask the tzaddik of the generation where his wife was? Aye Sara Ishtecha. Isn't that a little intrusive? I mean, imagine a man knocks on your door, <laughs> your husband answers, and the first question the man asks is, Where's your wife? I mean, what kind of question is that? It's an odd question for an angel to ask Avraham. Because Avraham could technically, technically answer and say, Well, what do you care where my wife is? Well, what's your, what's your business with my wife, you know? I mean, now, of course, we know that Rashi says the, the Malach, is, so Avraham should appreciate Sarah's tzniyot of being in the tent, but so we need to understand the deeper meaning behind this very odd question. And the Kotzka Rebbe answers beautifully. He says that Ruth's lineage is very important because where did she come from? Who did she descend from? Well, her great, 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 great grandfather was Moab. 
Where did Moab come from? If you remember, after Gavriel destroyed Sodom, the only survivors were Lot and his two daughters, because Lot's wife turned into a soul shaker, pretty much. And we all know the story. Lot and his daughters, they were in a cave, and his daughters innocently assumed that the entire world was destroyed, not just Sodom. They thought they were the only ones left in the whole world. So they did something that was prohibited in order to perpetuate the civilization of this world. And they knew that their father would never agree to it, so they caused them to become drunk and they, and they did what they did. Which means that Lot had an incestuous relationship with his daughters who conceived and gave birth to two sons, Ammon and Moab. Moab actually means Me'av, that he was born from his father. Moab's father was Lot. That makes Ruth a descendant of Lot, who was Avam's nephew. So it was good that Lot was saved from the destruction of Sodom. Lot being saved from Sodom is actually saving Mashiach, because if Lot would have not been saved, Moab would not have been born. And by extension, there would be no Ruth, no David, and Mashiach would still be in Shamaim somewhere. The greatest salvation in history, the greatest Hatzalah was the saving of Lot from Sodom because Gabriel was not saving Lot. He was saving the potential that was inside of him. Lot held a huge treasure of neshamot inside of him. There was a massive diamond within him called David. So if Lot is saved, David is saved, Mashiach is saved, and the entire world is saved. That's a big save. So the Katska Rebbe says something amazing. He said that Malach Gavriel was going to destroy Sodom because that was his job. But he needed to know if Lot should be saved or not. Seemingly, Lot didn't deserve to be saved. And also, he realized Hashem didn't tell him uh, to save Lot. But Hashem did instruct Gabriel to go to Abraham because the answer to his question of whether or not Lot should be saved will be answered by the tzaddik, by the rabbi of the generation, which is Avraham. And what's the real question over here? Malach Gavriel is thinking. Really, I should save Lot because of Ruth. I'm not saving Lot because of Lot. He doesn't deserve to be saved. I'm saving him because Moab needs to be born, because from Moab, Ruth descends. However, if Ruth is not going to be accepted into the Kahal Hashem anyway because she's a Moaviyah, why should I save Lot? There's no reason to save him if Ruth is not going to be considered legitimate to enter the assembly of God one day. But if I could find out in advance if Ruth will be accepted and she ends up yes, being permissible to enter the Kal Hashem, if she is really legitimate, and if David is legitimate, then I have to go save Lot. So really, the entire question of Gabriel was, do I save Lot? Equals, is Ruth legitimate or not? And what is that dependent on? It's dependent on whether or not we're going to hold the Moavi women guilty for not being hospitable. And what is that dependent on? The level of modesty, it's neot. So now Gabriel needs to know, was it really the way of the women not to go out to greet not even another woman?
Was it really just a matter of modesty that the Mo'aviyot didn't go out to greet the Jewish women? Be'emet? If yes, there's no claim against them. And then Ruth is legitimate, and by extension, so are all of her descendants. So Gavriel over here needed to ask a halachic question. The question was, is Ruth permissible to enter into the Kahal Hashem? Yes or no? If yes, Lot needs to be saved. So Gavriel asked Abraham the question in a very subtle way. And Abraham knew exactly what he was referring to. Gavriel asks him, Ayei Sarah Ishtecha, where is your wife Sarah? Avraham, who is the, the genius of the generation, understood what that means. Ah, it means, is it the way of the women to be visible? Is it the way of the women to go out and greet people? If yes, then the Moavi women are held accountable and guilty. And Ruth, by extension, is a Asura. So I'm not going to be able to save Lot. But Avraham, if it's not the way of the women to go out and greet anybody, then Ruth is leg legitimate. And that's dependent on where your wife is right now. Where is she? Aye Sarah Ishtecha. So the question of Aye Sarah Ishtecha, where is your wife Sarah? That was a loaded question. That's like. It's amazing. And when Avraham answered, Hine Ba'ohel, boom. That was the answer for all time. That answer was a halachic ruling for all eternity. Women don't go out to greet for reasons of tzini'ot. That means the mo'aviyot are permissible to enter into the Ka'al Hashem. That means Ruth is legitimate. That means David is permissible. That means Mashiach is kosher v'yosher. That means Lot now needs to be saved. But since Gabriel can only do one mission, which is to destroy Zdom, and he knew that Lot needed to be saved, another angel had to go with him. That's why Michael went along with him. And Chachamim say for Michael, this was not considered two missions. It was considered the same mission because telling Sarah, which was his mission, meaning Avraham to tell Sarah that she's going to have a son, that's creating a Misrael. And by going to save Lot, that's saving Am Yisrael, because it's bringing forth the seed of David and Mashiach into the world. So the saving of Lot is the saving of Am Yisrael. That's why Michael is the one who handled the union between Yehuda and Tamar as well. Because from Yehuda and Tamar, the line of Peretz, the seed of the kingdom of David and Mashiach, was born. So it's very interesting that any time there's an episode where Mashiach has to surface in the world, who is the Shadchan that gets involved? Malach Michael. Michael's job is to defend us and to involve himself in all these spiritual matters that result ultimately in the betterment of Am Yisrael. Once we know this, we can understand something else. The Gemara of Shabbat says that when Mashiach comes, Bezat Hashem, there's going to be such a massive celebration with a huge feast. At the end of that feast, at the end of the Sauda, we're going to have to recite the Birkat Amazon, the grace after meals. And the Rabbanim are going to look for a candidate to lead the Zimun. The first person they're going to approach is Avraham Avinu. I want to give him the, the kos, the cup, to lift up and to make the blessing. And Avraham is going to say, Rabotai, thank you for this honor, but I'm not worthy to recite this blessing because I am, after all, responsible for giving birth to Ishmael 
and all his descendants who came down to the world. So I'm, I'm not a suitable candidate. Please give the honor of the Zimun to somebody else. So they're going to approach Yitzhak. But he's going to say, I thank you for the honor, but I'm not worthy to make the blessing because I brought Hesav and the kingdom of Edom into the world. So I'm not very comfortable with this honor. Please uh, uh, give it to somebody else. So they'll approach Yaakov Avinu, alav shalom, the Bechir Sheba'avot, the choices of the forefathers, and, and he's going to say, uh, thank you so much, but as you know, I married two sisters, Rachel and Leah, which was a questionable act at that time, so I am not so comfortable making the zimun. I'm sure there are other tzaddikim greater than me, please give the honor to them. The Gemara says that the Rabbanim are going to go down the list <laughs> and each righteous person, each tzaddik is going to give a reason why he's not suitable to lead the Birkat Amazon, the grace after meals. The last, last person they're going to approach, which is a sad thing, they're going to ask David Amelech. Please make the zimun. What will David say? David is going to say, Ani avarech. I'll recite the blessing. I'll gladly accept this honor. Velina elevarech. And you should know that I'm worthy to recite this blessing. Shene'emar, just as it states, Kos Yeshuot Esa Uvishem Adonai Yekra Kos Yeshuot Esa I shall raise the cup of salvation Uvishem Hashem Ekra and I will call out in the name of God It seems that David HaMelech already predicted what the future would hold for him. He knew that the day would come where he'd be able to raise that exalted cup. Asks the Shlah HaKadosh, Alam HaShalom, why did David HaMelech feel that he was the right person to make this zimun, this blessing? And he answers, there's a halacha that says, Oreach mevarech, which means when you have a guest at a, sh a table, Shabbat table, Chag table, doesn't matter what, the normal protocol according to the halacha, according to the law, is that the balabait, the host is the one who should recite the blessing over the hamotzi, over the bread. The host should never give the honor to somebody else. Why? Because if you give that kavod to a guest, the guest might feel embarrassed that as he's breaking the, the bread, he might be embarrassed that he took a large portion for himself. So the host should be the one to, to, to give out the portions of the bread. But when it comes to birkat mazon, when it comes to grace after meals, you should bestow the honor on the guest because he can then bless your home. He could do the, the mitzvah of the oreach, of blessing your home and your family. So David HaMelech says, Rabotai, Avraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, you are all considered the Baale Batim. You're the masters of the home. You were born into this religion. You're part of the house. But I came from root. I came from outside the religion. I'm like a stranger, a guest. So I'm considered an oreach, just a guest. And what's the law? The rule is that the guest should recite the zimun. And if you're all gonna say, David, yes, you're a guest, but you're a guest that's not legitimate. 
because there's always been a question about your validity. Well, I can tell you that you're mistaken. I'm 100% legitimate. And you know where I got the validity from? I get it from Sarah. She was modest. She was in the tent. And because she was in the tent, that made my great grandmother Ruth legitimate and that legitimizes me. Says the Shla Kadosh. That's why David said the words, Kos Yeshuot Esa. Because the words Esa spelled Aleph, Shin Aleph, is Rashetevot. Aye, Sarah. Ishtecha. Oh, oh. Which means that David Amelech was hinting to everybody. Do you know why I have the right to make this blessing? To lift this cause shell bracha, this cup of salvation, and recite the zimun? You know why I'm 100% legitimate? It's because of that one question that was posed to Avraham Avinu long ago. Ayei Sarah Ishtecha. That question and its answer made me permissible, made me legitimate, and made me worthy to enter the Ka'al Hashem, the assembly of God. Incredible. Oh, the Torah is astounding. It's amazing. It's amazing. Yes, it is. It's just incredible. I'll conclude with this beautiful chidush that was written by Chacham Yaakov Tarab Masselton, Alav Shalom, in a Sefer Bet Yaakov. We just learned that Megillat Ruth was Shmuel Anavi's way of legitimizing. David Amelech <coughs> and the entire line of Ruth Amoavia until Mashiach. That's a long line. <coughs> so, Rabbi Yaakov made the following observation. I don't know if any of you guys noticed this, and I don't know if any of you guys ever noticed this out there. Open up a Megillat Ruth. And if you're going to notice, every Pasuk in Megillat Ruth, every verse, begins with the letter Vav except for eight Psukim and all the Mepharshim wonder is there a hidden code embedded in these eight Psukim? Surely there must have been because the entire Megillah is just Vav, 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 Vav and only eight Psukim are other, other letters so let's take a look at the first letter of each of those eight psukim. Maybe there's a hidden message that Shmuel Navi was encrypting in the Megillah. One pasuk starts with a yud. Another starts with a shin. Another with an ayin. One with another yud. One pasuk starts with a bet, another one with an aleph, one with a hay, and one with a lamid. Eight psukim, eight letters. Those eight letters spell the following two words. Yish'i ba'ohel. My salvation is in the tent. Oh. <laughs> Are you guys falling off your chairs? Are you guys, I don't know, this like ding, 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 ding. Like one of my students, Courtney, in Los Angeles, California, would say, drop the mic. That's the dropping of the mic moment. Shmuel Anavi was telling us all. I'm writing the story of David Amelech. 
And do you know how David earned his legitimacy? You know why through him the ultimate salvation will be born, the Mashiach and the final redemption? It's because of the Ohel, the tent. Whose tent? The tent of Sarah Imenu. Aye Sarah Ishtecha. He neighbor Ohel. Ladies, that was a very important remez that Shmuel Navi provided us because the entire purpose of Megillat Ruth was to tell us about the lineage of David HaMelech. That's the whole point. And how his existence, and more than that, his legitimacy came to be. You know what that teaches us? I don't even know if you guys are going in this direction yet. It teaches us two things. First of all, it teaches us, us women, <laughs> I don't know if you guys realize this, the importance and the magnitude of tzniot, of modesty. Without tzniot, there's no Mashiach. Without modesty, there would, be, there would be no Mashiach ben David. Mashiach comes in the merit of a woman's modesty. HaKadosh Baruch Hu sees that the Jewish women are modest, and you know what that does? It reaffirms the derech. It solidifies the way of the Jewish people. It reaffirms the ways of Sarah. Our tzini'ut actually is reaffirming the validity of Ruth, the validity of David HaMelech, and the strength of Mashiach Tzitkenu. Every time a woman is modest, every time a woman chooses to wear an article of clothing that is modest and proper, every time she doesn't spend too much time out in the streets, but is in the Ohel, you're validating and you're legitimizing David HaMelech, Ruth HaMuaviyah, and the Mashiach all over again, time and time and time and time again. It's it's a current process of legitimacy. So as you can see, Shavuot <laughs> is not just the holiday of the giving of the Torah. We know it's also the yard site of David HaMelech. And David HaMelech fathers the seed of Mashiach. And we know that Hashem wants to bring the Mashiach in the biggest way. And the Gemara, by the way, proves it by asking, when did Galut Mitzrayim, the exile of Egypt, Egypt, actually begin? The Gemara says it officially started when Yitzhak Avinu Alav Shalom was born. From the time of Yitzhak's birth to the day we left Egypt is a total of 400 years. So the exile began when Yitzhak was born. But I want you to notice something amazing. At the time that Galut Mitzrayim was manifesting, what was Hashem doing even before Yitzchak was born? Hashem tells Michael, the angel, go save Lot. Why? Because Hashem was already establishing the seed of Mashiach, which means much before the first exile even began, Hashem was already planting the seeds of the final redemption through the saving of Lot. That's how much HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants to bring the Mashiach. Yitzhak is not even born, and he's already, already producing the seeds of the redemption. But most importantly, ladies, in the schut of the tzniyot of the women, in the merit of their modesty, Mashiach is born. He ratzon, that as a result of our tzniyot, all the imahot, all our foremothers should smile down upon us from shamayim and, and plead to Hashem on our behalf. May we merit to give Sarah Imenu Nachat a lot of joy 
and pleasure as we continue on her path of modesty. May we be worthy to be true benot melech, true daughters of the king, to embrace our honor with dignity and with pride, to know who we descend from and how much greatness we create in the world. And more than that, how much, how much depends on us. But most of all, may every article of clothing that we wear that's modest and noble, Every, every word that we utter that's refined and stately. Every step that we take that's dignified and majestic. It should be a living testimony of Ruth HaMoaviyah's validity. And it should continue to provide David HaMelech with his legitimacy. Because in the merit of our modesty, we continue, as I said, to reaffirm his rightful place amid the Holy Assembly, amid the Kahal Kadosh of Am Yisrael. And Be'ezrat Hashem, this will yield tremendous Yeshuot from Shamayim. And these two great ancestors, Ruth and David, will continue to beseech the Ribbono Shel Olam for the ultimate redemption so that Mashiach can legitimately be crowned can reveal himself and bring us all back in the merit of the righteous women. Amen, Ken. Yehi Ratzon.